Good evening, everybody. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, we're yes. not yeah, excellent. We're not kitted out with microphones, unfortunately. So if you can't hear me at all, you, you can bring to try to move a bit closer. Um, it's a very great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's kind of book talk. Um, the second in our 2022-23 program. Um, I'm Dr. Rob Lloyd. I'm a teacher of English literature here at Cardiff University. I'm one of the members of the book club team, um, along with Susan, who will be leading the conversation this evening with Tessa, um, as well as Emma and Marco, as well as our student volunteers, and Rachel and Bonnie as well. It's great to have you both here. Um, we're delighted to see you for the first in-person book talk event in nearly two and a half years, pre-pandemic. Um, we're also live streaming this event, courtesy of this device. You might be able to see me in front of me on the table, this the avian technology known as the owl. I think it's called Merlin, is that right? Merlin the owl. Um, and he'll be able to kind of record the session, which will then be uploaded to our YouTube channel afterwards as a record of tonight's conversation. Um, so before I introduce our wonderful guest for this evening, I want to say a few words about tonight's uh, kind of format of tonight's event, um, as well as some housekeeping matters. Firstly, I'd like, on behalf of Book Talk, to send our thanks to Literature Wales for their generous support of this evening. Um, uh, after the main event, there will be an opportunity for you all to ask questions. Um, for those of us who are here in person, uh, I'd recommend or ask you please to kind of, uh, when the time comes, raise your hand and I will be uh, identifying those who would like to see. I'd ask you to do that until after the event, don't do it during so that we can keep the event running as smoothly as possible. Um, those watching online, I think there are a few possibly, if you would like to kind of participate as well, there should be a Q&A function on the Zoom, uh, just kind of make questions in there, the pass them to me and we'll make sure that they're so clear that we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can during the evening. Um, we're not expecting any fire drills this evening, so if the alarm goes, it will be for real. Um, I've been told that Rob on reception will come and kind of collect us if that's the issue, but it's essentially back the way we came towards the front building and a fire posted there. So calmly, but kind of quickly, um, pick your way to there if the alarm does, uh, should sound. Um, now, for those of you who are here in person this evening, towards the end of the evening, we'll be circulating these feedback forms. Um, and we'd really ask you, if you don't mind, to take a few minutes to fill those in for us. Um, they provide really valuable information about what you've got out of book talk, um, kind of what you might like to see in future events. And this kind of public engagement really is what book talk does best. And that's kind of what keeps us going. So if you would be able to give us some support through the feedback form, we would really, really appreciate it. So um, I should say as well, we also, now that we're back to an in-person or kind of hybrid event, we very much hope to see you at our future events that we've got coming up. We're still working to finalize the details, but if you keep an eye on our blog, we're available at cardiffbooktalk.com, uh, cardiffbooktalk.org, is that right, Jane? Um, is there, and then we also have a kind of variety of social media channels as well to kind of follow us on. The details are always posted there. We very much hope to see some of you back for those. So uh, we knew after such a long wait to come back in person uh, that we'd have to offer a pretty special opening event. And I think you'll agree that we've exceeded those ambitions that we set for ourselves. Um, we're delighted to welcome Tessa Hadley this evening to join us uh, to discuss her latest novel, Free Love, um, in conversation with our own Dr. Susan Morgan, one of the amazing creative writing staff members here and based in the School of English Communication and Philosophy. Uh, so Tessa lives in Cardiff, is a Cardiff resident, and is the prize-winning author of eight novels and three collections of short stories. Her novels, which include The London Train, Clever Girl, and Late in the Day, have reached the long list of the Orange Prize um, and the Wales Book of the Year. And in 2016, she won the Hawthornden Prize and one of the Wyndham Campbell Prizes for her contribution to literature. She has won great acclaim in her collections of short stories as well, which appeared in a number of publications. Uh, Free Love, which is her eighth novel, um, was published in January 2022 and is currently in development as a drug TV drama series, I believe, um, which is very exciting. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to get out of the way. Um, so, would you please join me in welcoming Tessa and Susan for this evening today? Thank you very much, Bob. Well, it is great to see you, Tessa. A real pleasure. Welcome to part of the talk. We're thrilled you could be here to talk with us about your latest novel and to read short extracts from it too and then to take audience questions and answers. And 
And it's such a, it's been such a treat to read the novel, knowing that you're going to be here to talk to me about it, because it's a very different way of reading, I found. And I thought perhaps because we're in a building where geography, city and planning are taught, and a few floors up above us, we could start by talking about the role of place in the novel. Because it seems to me that it, it looms so large. And but what I'm interested in and what I'm going to ask you is about how you actually do this. It's much more than just scene setting. These these places that you describe that are more than static backdrops to the event or the action. I'm interested in how they work within the narrative and whether that was a conscious decision in your part and the way they help us see who yeah. particular characters yeah. are. So I think I think that's just probably my vision of the world is it's, it's very much I'm very much not a universalist who thinks love is the same whether you put it down in Cardiff or that Grove or Leeds and whether you have it in 1940 or 1960 or 2022 I I sort of take a kind of anthropological perspective to dignify it uh, and I and I think. There is that wonderful saying by Clifford Geertz, the great anthropologist, of how much difference difference makes. It's my credo. And I feel as if the place your life happens in, or a part of your life happens in, is so much more than the backdrop. Mm -hmm. it, it is the colour of your scene and the shape of your imagining and the nature of your choices. It, it's tangled up with that. And so I always have a place that is vivid to me almost as soon as the conception of the book comes. Quite why these places in this book is a, is a trickier question because I, I sort of said it in the home counties in the 1960s about which I know really nothing. I, I, I'm a Bristolian. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing appeals to my imagination about that vanished world of what was at the time London, this dull suburbia, commuter journey outside London, and sort of near the Thames in green fields, that sort of comfortable Englishness. I mean, I think the only people who live in these sort of houses now that Phyllis and Roger live in, they're probably Russian oligarchs. It's gone, that world, that, that very safe, seeming, demure Englishness, actually. So what what it did? I, I actually wrote a short story called An Abduction, and I set it in the home counties in the nineteen sixties. And I thought this is delicious. I love writing about this, and I don't know how I know about it, but I think I, I think I read a lot of it. Actually, and a lot of my sense of it comes from reading. I did have cousins who lived in Cape in Surrey, so that fills it out. But used to put them. Mm -hmm. And equally with Labrador Grove, crazy counterculture world, um, everything. Mad and lodging houses and great kind of politics. It's not really that. That's not yeah. my world either. So, and I was curious because I I'm I'm quickly going to ask you to maybe talk a bit more about that um in a different way, which is we don't as readers we don't just see these places and you know they're over, the overgrown gardens in the suburbs mm. or the cluttered the cluttered rural house or the derelict land the purple streets that run down streets in London we don't just see them we learn about a character who's also seen them and it's your way of yeah. introducing it to yeah. the character and you open the book in that way I think yeah. it's a wonderful opening it's a sort of a resonant opening and I did wonder if you'd mind reading to us from those opening pages, just to give everybody an illustration of what we've been talking about. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And again, I am really sort of making this up, which is after all what none of this is supposed to do. Make it up and then check it against something. But if you ask me exactly what are you checking it against, that's a, that's a very mm -hmm. interesting and deep question. But just, just before I read it, by the way, there's something interesting about writing the place for me. Mm -hmm. Which is that I find Cardiff very difficult to write about. I have written about this in two of my books, I've never been completely happy. And I I think it's because whereas I can use Bristol where I grew up, and I don't even need to name Bristol. Anyone can write about London. London's a high grade, everybody, it's anybody. Bristol I can use without naming it. 
But somehow you write about the capital of Wales. You have to somewhere address Welshness. And I think I think well, I don't have anything interesting to say about Welshness. Isn't that it? So it was just if, if a curiosity that I'd actually forgotten, having gone away from Cardiff and lived in London for 10 years, come back now for a couple of years, in every way happy, very, very happy to be back. We lived in 30 years. But it's hard. I, I don't know how to quite root my writing. That's not at all relevant to the story, doesn't it? So this is literally the opening of the first chapter. This Friday evening in late summer was so lovely that Phyllis Fisher sat at her dressing table with the window wide open onto the garden. Life flowed into the room from beyond the window in its drowsy suburban evening stream the steady, relieving splash of a hose in a herbaceous border, confiding clap of shears, distant clap of balls from the tennis club, broken sharp cries of children playing, fragrance of cut grass and roasting meat, jiggling of ice in the first weekend gin and tonics. When slanting low sunlight was suddenly blinding in one wing of the dressing table mirror, Phyllis adjusted it and the light ran instead around the cut glass toiletry set and her bottles of lead and palm and witch hazel and cleansing them. She sat forward in her petticoat, leaning on her elbows to see more clearly in the mirror, feeling the floating of the breeze on her bare shoulders, smelling the soap on her skin. She was 40, but still had a expectant, animated prettiness. Her sadly tanned face was brushed with faint freckles above the upturned nose. Her rather dry fair hair, not yellow, but a shadow of gold like washed out straw, was backcombed into volume for tonight and stiff with hairspray. She put on pale lipstick carefully, pressing her lips together, frowning at the mirror because she thought that her mouth was too big, too soft and indefinite if she might blurt out something coarse or raw. And yet she was easy, an easy person, easily made happy, glad to make others happy. She was pleased with her life. The year was 1967. I don't think that's a good Okay. No, thank you, Tessa. Um, I love the way you're setting things up here because it's not going to be long. No, probably not. You know the novel. It's not going to be long before that, that sort of delighted um, satisfaction of life is going to be tested. It would be difficult to, 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 to yeah. put that into the opening page of yeah. the novel without raising the expectation yeah. of the door of that stasis and yeah. equilibrium. Is it's, like, it's, it's like a first impression of somebody, mm. isn't it? And it's really powerful. But for me, it, I feel this is some, somebody who's sort of highly attuned to her, her sensory impressions. And yeah, she's delighted by life itself yeah. and living and the yeah. physicality of it and the way things look and feel. Yeah, yeah. She, so and that's, that's astute of you, Sue, because actually, as a narrator in that bit I've just read, well, I, it's partly me, but it's partly her. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing all the time with this lovely fluid line that the novel can have you can you can be telling it that isn't her inner thought it was me telling it and certainly it's me when suddenly I say it's 1967 obviously yeah. but you're right that I'm telling you about this woman that she's mm. she's feeling on her skin on her nerve ends in her skin this this impression and I hope it makes us whatever we think about what mm. she does feel she's somebody She's very alive. Yeah, so she's a, she's a woman of a particular time. I mean, you mentioned place before, and now I know you can what time, mm -hmm. and you mentioned it earlier, because it's where history comes in. It made me think that opening scene of um, Phyllis, with her, yeah. if you read on, you can you understand how much she's fond of her home, yeah. and the objects in it, and she feels a lot of her energy in their making some desire of the place to be. Um, it reminded me of a pop art painting or collage construction. It really did this pop art relevant to the time. Uh -huh. uh, show, you know, it was where art and fashion and music, popular music and advertising all collided and worked together. But it was a particular version of what it is to be female 
that I think pop art is interesting for. And I don't think any of that sophisticated mm. critique is available to Phyllis yet. No. She's going to learn some of that later, but she's mm. relatively unconscious of this moment, yeah. I think. She almost seemed to me to be one of those women who comes to the pop art college. Well, yeah, in, yes, they're not most of the same at the time were men. It's only recently that, say, Pauline Bowden had a marvelous book written about her, a young, mm. sadly, very, very young female artist in the 60s. It's only been kind of rediscovered, but most of the thing, I mean, you, people in the audience will probably correct me, but I imagine most of the pop artists were male, were they? It was the way the women were. Presented in these paintings, which reminded me of Phyllis for some reason, uh -huh. with her objects around her, her dress uh -huh. that you describe her in. There's a funny novel of the era, what's it called? Pumpkin Eater. Who's that? Uh -huh. Penelope Mortimer. Uh -huh. Penelope Mortimer, uh -huh. which I think has more of that uh -huh. feeling you're talking about, uh -huh. actually, of the, uh -huh. the dissociation that the pop artist holding on to, that, that there's something deeply uneasy in faith. I think my Phyllis is more wholehearted. Yeah. She's more of a sucker in a way. She's living it. She's yeah. Living it. Yeah. That's interesting. Because mm -hmm. I, I wondered, what was it that you said made you decide to set the novel in the 60s? Was it somebody that you knew? Or were there stories in your family? Were, were you thinking of family members or stories of people they knew? That seems to sort of these things could only happen at that time. Yeah, I'm not particularly in my family, but I I suppose I'm very aware of women who are now very old. In fact, I, I mean, wouldn't Phyllis be in her nineties now if she lived? So she's sort of she's sort of my mother's age, she even a little older. Uh, my mum didn't walk out in her marriage, and in fact was rather appalled with Phyllis in the book for doing so. <laughs> couldn't forgive her, but. I, I think I, I've grown up all my life with my awareness of that historical moment for women, watching my own mum certainly at her dressing table doing her face mm. and spraying on her and there to put perfume and being that pleasing, mm. that sexy, mm. attractive woman. Interestingly, by the way, talking about history and time, <clears throat> you might have noticed I said she was 40, but still mm. attractive. And my American editor said, well, you, but surely it's Anne. And I said, not, not in 1967, it wasn't. And when my mother returned 40, my brother let it out of the bag somehow at some dinner party and she shook him. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that makes my mouth sound. Well, she was really not very violent, but that didn't touch a nerve. Mm -hmm. It was very angry. And that comes through very strongly in that. Yeah, she's actually. Yes, yeah. that she has this horror of mm -hmm. losing her youthful. Mm -hmm. Her youthful mm -hmm. is what she. You know her, her desirability, as she sees yeah. it, and her. After that, life will not be the same. Yeah, and she has this horror, doesn't she? When she touch, she acts, sort of accidentally touches the, the the very disreputable dinner guest who arrives over an hour late. Yeah, drunk <laughs> with the sheep hair, dirty sheep hanging out of his trousers to avoid arriving. Yeah. And she touch, she act, accidentally touches his shoulder while passing him a drink. I think. And feels him flinching, mm. and she thinks he finds me repulsive mm. because I'm an old woman. And then later on, her daughter says, that, "Oh, Mandy Veery cleared away the dishes." And she thinks he not only thinks I'm repulsive, he knows I've got a servant. <laughs> He's going to eat me. Mm. So yes, it's interesting because she's, and I wondered if that was that whole, uh, she even uses the word repulsive, doesn't she? She's got very strong reactions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her condition um, being. Her being is very much positive on, on the fact of her attractiveness, mm. which is not that old a story. No. And uh, it's a millennial story and it's fascinating. And I, I went to go back to your original question, mm. so why this story? I mean, that was that was a part of it. I, I think it was a moment of immense, fracture in the 60s mm. uh, where quite a few bourgeois women who had settled for the old story were sort of shaken out of that life for one reason or another into something new 
And I'm not sure that thing ever quite happened again in the same way. It was, it was the juxtaposition of the old way with its respectable forms and its class hierarchies and the new way. And that, that's actually very generative for a novel, for, for writing. Yeah, it's got lots and lots of stuff in it. The possibility of extreme change. Yeah. And, and in the middle of it, the very strong tradition in the novel form, it's, it's a woman's consciousness carrying that change or even experiencing it in a way sort of in her body, I mm -hmm. suppose. Um, I mean, there's a point soon after, <laughs> soon after that, that sort of where she feels um, her little guests sort of shrinking. Yeah, guests. it's because her hands are really cold because she put yeah. her hands in the ice bucket. Um, and he, that's why he actually recoils. And in fact, it's only at that moment that he actually notices and of her thinks she's quite attractive. Yeah, it's a, a nice yeah. drop purposes. Yeah. There. But there's a, there's a, there's a, I mean, it's a very awkward dinner party. I know I'm sure you had quite a lot of fun writing it because sort of everything feels so uncomfortable. Maybe not Roger. No. And the reasons for that only become clearer later about why he's I also think he's a man who doesn't easily feel uncomfortable. He knows what to do in many given circumstances. Mm -hmm. I think if you were at Monte Cassino in the war, a suburban dinner party probably doesn't set you back that much. Very good. Um, they're all, there's a phone call, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And it, you must realise, of course, that Philip is a mother of two. She has a son of nine at the start of the novel, and her daughter, who's older. And Hugh's been sent up to bed too late, but Colette is back on the table. Um, and then the phone rings, and it's one of Hugh's friend's mother, who's very bossy, and almost insists that someone go out into the darkened nighttime garden to find this lost sandal, which happens to be, her son later tells her, preposterously in a fountain next to a nymph, a statue of a nymph. So we have little boy sandal by a nymph. In a fountain. So these are the things that it was such a great fun to write. And you yeah. don't know all that before you start the chapter. What I knew was that I had to get them out in the garden. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the young, disheveled, drunk dinner guest was going to kiss Phyllis and that it was mm -hmm. going to hold the novels with a fan out from there. But I didn't know how I would get them out there. And I wrote just, just after what bit I read. She hears her children running around in the mm -hmm. garden outside, her child, sorry, Hugh, and his gang. Mm -hmm. and, and I just say the children are pushing between one garden and another. They're sort of wild where the adults came. And at some point, somebody misses a stepping stone and puts foot in a pond. And then as I thought, I'm oh, trying to get them out in the garden, I thought, oh, someone's put his foot in the pond. I bet his sandal fell off. And then I can have, and then the whole character of the rather awful mother the mom's crisis, who say they must think we're made of money, and Phyllis thinks to herself, but they are made of money, they're stinking rich, they can afford in that sandal. But the, all those jokes and mm. all that development on the detail, and the fact, as you say, Sue, that the pond is beside a nymph, so that when she, Nikki, she will dinner, dinner guest, finally find a way through to it, it's sort of like a secret. Grotto, Venus Grotto, <laughs> in the middle of suburbia. With, with, Trickling water and this little nymph is probably sort of awful and made of concrete, but it doesn't matter in the dark, she's presiding over the mist. So that's all. There's a little fun that you have yeah. as you're writing. That came through, the sort of wittiness is really strong, and your pleasure in the writing is infectious. It was lovely to read. But there was an interesting point, which is where um, they're arguing at one point who should go out to look for the Los Santos because Colette has to be the next door cat anyway. And there was a line that I wanted you to explain to us all because she, Phyllis realises she wants to get away from whatever she found at the dinner table. Hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting, slightly odd expression because she hasn't really been attending to the conversation at the dinner table, which has been quite political because Roger had had to lived in Egypt, um, Lebanon. Like, well, and, and then they lived in Cairo, yes. And then also Nicky, though, was partly born, yeah, or grew up in. Uh, he spent time in Tehran, yes, his, and then he was sent back to the UK to Paul yeah. boarding school. They have a quite political conversation, yeah, like men do in those days. 
Um, Phyllis doesn't really attend to it, but we're made aware that she she picks up on the disapproval of the tweet towards. Is that what she's running away? Yeah, just that thing you were talking about earlier, just that, that sense that, that happens to her all of a sudden, like an initiation, mm -hmm. not gradually, but all of a sudden, I can't remember what exactly it is I write, but something like, she had thought she'd grow closely into old age, you know, that she would just go on being charming and very well observed, mm -hmm. and she suddenly realises that she's taken for granted that her sexual self would persist I call it something like a, like a, a nugget to like mm -hmm. a, a nuclear in her that, that would last. And then suddenly she thinks, I've revolted this young man. It's over. It's, and that's why she wants to go out of the club. So it's not to do with the portrayal of the family as seen by somebody like Nicky. Well, yeah. No, because the whole load comes all at once. Yeah. All at once. She's a boring old suburban housewife. She's not a poor fish. She so she immediately supplies the rest. And he thinks we're dull as ditch water. And he put his cigarette out in my food. Um, I think I had him putting a cigarette. I'm in always using that terrain. in the terrain. Exactly. And the cool. whole lot that suddenly says. Your life's awful. You thought on page one that your life was lovely, and somebody does this rips this mm. curtain open and says your life is awful. And because Phyllis isn't an idiot, because she feels things on her nerve ends, she's not an intellectual, but she's super sensible. Sense yeah. Therefore, this is that all it all happens to her, and this is what primes her anyway. Yeah. Poor old Nikki kisses her in the garden, thinking really. I ought to if I'm not bourgeois. He means nothing by it. And she thinks, he's my love. This is the change of my life. I'm leaving. Literally like that, like a mad woman, because she sort of is a bit mad. She's stubborn. And, and they have and drank a lot. They have, and everybody's yeah, drunk a lot. They were all 18, 19, over an hour. They were. They were. They were. Um, so all this, what's so impressive is all this happens in just the one chapter, the first chapter. So it's it's really a wonderful kind of introduction to the whole of the nuclear family and, and a woman who's or she's she's at one in one sense she's very impressionable, isn't she? She's very aware of how other people are seeing her mm -hmm. and the fact that they might see her in a certain way really knocks her off balance. Well, I think that certainly is how women were trained. That's what they were trained to be very good at. And, um, you know, that doesn't happen. Yeah. And it does it. No. With our age, she says. So I was, it made me think of some of the women in, say, Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook, mm -hmm. who would have called themselves three women mm -hmm. at that time. Now, Phyllis isn't in chapter one, three women, but she may change towards. She's going to evolve. Yeah, I mean, actually, if it's much worse reading Doris I don't like the Golden Notebook. I find it really unreadable, but I love lots of Doris Lessing, and I mm -hmm. love her own life story, of course, is in my mind. But yeah. I, I mean, mm -hmm. Phyllis is not Doris Lessing. But the Martha Quest yeah. set in Salisbury or Harare now is yeah. where not young Martha marries and signs up for, I mean, a life of Philistinism and narrowness is horrifying, and then makes her violent break with it. That's mm. the marvellous. It, it's a, a, a wonderful paradigm of this era, era of yeah. break, fracture, with a, yeah. with, a, with a past, a simplifying, but rather sometimes quite angry. And, and it's questioning maybe of, of motherhood as it was sentimentalised in yeah. the 60s, and the pressure that was put on women to hold the family together. You know, I was talking about this the other day, actually, interestingly, with Margaret Drabble. And uh, my own self, she disagreed with me, and she, she was there. She wasn't one of these things. So who am I to say? I suspect among this class of women, which were not super top bourgeois, uh, it was probably somewhat easier to leave your children behind than it would be now. Mm -hmm. I think there was less of a sentimental mm -hmm. cult of motherhood then. And especially, I mean, you were sending your kids away to boarding school. You were sending, certainly sending them with the boy away at nine, which is going, which breaks, which is going to break his heart. And in one sense, I've given her an alibi in the whole novel. It's terrible that she leaves her children, but she was going to lose her boy anyway, and she actually can't bear that. 
And in some slightly inchoate way, which she's not fully aware of, she's bargaining with that. And she's saying, well, if I can't have you, mm -hmm. he's going to be taken away from me and turned into a man. I'll have this instead. And that, that isn't like a justification, but it's a, a machinery that's going on in her mind. Yeah. But so I, my hunch is that there was a lighter version of motherhood, you know, but it was full of sentimentality. But, but one, the verdict now would be more condemnatory than it would have been in 1960. But, but Margaret Travel didn't agree and she oh. was there. Well, she just said, I love my children without reserve, but I kind of think it's cause. And so did many, many mothers. But yeah, anyway, that's a, that's well, a so interesting question for sociology. Interesting, you brought up the fact that Hume, because it comes in quite early, doesn't it? Hume is going to go away to school. Hmm. And it's not as if there's any discussion, it's not negotiable. And no. it's partly her, Phyllis's protest against that, mm -hmm. that tra very traditional, mm -hmm. house bound way of life. Mm -hmm. Where it was always seemed to be a concern if a boy was to come to his mother. Yeah, and they are incredibly close. And in so, fact, I supplied her with a very conventional piece of thinking, just for comedy, really, where she is obviously slightly worried that he might grow up gay if yeah. she loves him too much. I mean, that, yeah. that's not me thinking that's a possibility. That's me knowing that that's what women in the 1960s mm. often thought. Because they, they're very alike, they're very kind of articulate, aren't they? He uses yeah. some vocabulary that you wouldn't expect a man year old to have. Yeah. And he's still, he's quite happy to, to be physical with his mother, or yet a later yeah. age than most children would. Yeah. Doesn't mind if his friends see him kiss, kissing her. But he's going to lose yeah. all that. All that's in girls. And what's so fascinating is he, you're, it's a novel of absences. So, first, Phyllis disappears. She does a run. You know, we need to explain how that happened, but we, we haven't got time tonight. So we need to a lot. So uh, Phyllis disappears, and we're left with a, a very diminished household mm. because Hugh has also been sent away. He's, mm. he's away. Mm. He's suddenly away. Colette and Roger having to kind of make a life for themselves there. And they're sort of stepping around oh. nervously. Oh. Nobody can really say what's happening. Oh. I think uh, Roger very kindly tries to say, well, she's got to go away for a few days initially. Mm -hmm. And then she's maybe a bit unhappy with all being here. She's got to have a little bit of a break. Yeah. And um, it wasn't the days when you sat your children down and explained no, no, what happened and what that really felt really about that. it. And... But, but Hugh is such an interesting accent because you really feel. The pain in it, the, the, his mother's pain, but also Hugh's pain. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one friend who read the book said that she read the book Worrying for the Women in the book, but when she closed it, actually, it was the men that she was alarmed yeah. for. And Hugh definitely is the victim, I suppose, in the in the novel. It's something, I, I do make a very beautiful little boy at the beginning, full of charm and full mm -hmm. of some energy and brightness. And even the first time he comes home from school, his sister sees that he's washed, different, diminished. Yeah. And 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 I've no doubt that's partly because his mother has gone. But I I I think it's also school. Yeah. So uh he's going to where he ends up loathing his mother, he doesn't want anything to do with her. And I think it's not giving anything too much away to say that, you know, the very last pages of the book, when I'm sort of putting it all together, looking forward, his mother and he do meet very occasionally, and they have the most awful lunches where she rattles on minor nothingness, mm. and he just eats as much as he can and drinks as much mm. Coca-Cola as he can and can't wait to get away. And it's that's, that's sort of almost the most the saddest the scene thing. in the book, I think. And it, you know, the very fact that she has another child. And, and now you that, are thinking this way. Well, well like, no, no, it's not a good, I'm joking, is it? No, everyone's joking. Yeah. Yeah, yes, no, she has another child, and that's really, and I knew that. <laughs> I had a funny book, it just is such a. Uh, I might be romancing this now after the fact, but it felt as if the whole book fell into my lap all at once, and I knew almost everything that was going to happen, which is unfortunately doesn't usually happen. And um, anyway, it, it, I've, I've got pages in my notebook that are the first pages I ever wrote about this novel, and it's all there. I, I have 
the, the first chapter and Nikki come to dinner and the kiss and then she leaves and I have her having another child and I have Colette following her into London and Hugh going to school and I even have what all this, everything in it. And what an evolution of a person because she's decided by the end of the novel, now that we're allowed to talk about the end of the novel, she, her, her third child is not going to have that. No, not really. No. But Hugh is, is kind of forced into mm -hmm. And it's almost as if that's what she's grown, that's what she's decided to do. There's a very interesting point in the novel, isn't there? A sort of a turning point. Yeah. Where, yeah. And it's a real, it's a self realization. It's not yeah. the omniscient yeah. narrator telling us, it's the character herself yeah. realizing. Mm -hmm. In a deep, deep part of it. Yes, yes, it is. Because got the chain. Obviously, the revolution in the 1960s and the counterculture was hugely political. But that isn't how it first comes to fit. It comes as an emotional, personal story. But there is this scene. Do you want me to read yes, it? There is this scene. She hasn't actually yet left home. She's visiting Nikki, Nikki secretly. And it's the first time they've spent the night together. And they... Um, they've made love and uh, then they have an argument and he just, I'll, I'll sort of abridge it a little bit as I'm reading and it's what I, I, I wanted Phyllis is not an intellectual she's never going to get history right She's never going to actually, she isn't even going to be much of a marcher or a campaigner. But something in her, and she says at some point later on, every cell in my body is changed. And there's a way of politics operating at that personal psychic level. It stops you being a bourgeois housewife to some extent. Perhaps that's always in you somewhere. And it, she transforms into a different being mm. and definitely into a woman who is not going to send her other little boy away to school and who's going to live her life in a shabby flat and, and love it and want to be there and want to be in that multicultural, multi-ethnic community in West London and sort of be against the government. And it doesn't go much further than that, but I'm actually, I think it's deep. The change is deep and real. And I think that was a real deep change that happened to a lot of people in the 60s and early 70s. So this is sort of happening to Phyllis. Um, do you really think that politics is pig shit? Phyllis, who's never, yeah, she could only have used that word shit in the dark. She had never spoken it out loud before. Do you think what my husband does is pig shit too? Switching on the office desk lamp, which she kept on a crate beside the bed. Nikki said it was an odd moment to bring up the subject of her husband. And she says, I know you don't believe in what he does. She got up from the bed, raising her arms to undo the zip of her dress and stepping out of it, leaving it crumpled on the floor. Suddenly they couldn't touch each other. Of course I don't believe in it, Nikki said. What he does not see. He works at the foreign Don't you know it really? There's a lie at the bottom of our civilization. Men like your husband, for all their decency and wisdom and experience, don't address the lie. In fact, in their own way, they help to maintain it. What is the lie? Do you mean money? Not worse than that, deeper. Like those wise men on the news, on television, pretending to be grown-ups, pretending they know what they're talking about, mangled bloody secrets inside the reasonable words. I think that seems normal and reasonable really is. Men in suits like your husband sit around calmly in meetings deciding whether it's necessary to drop bombs on villagers and children, which is an obscenity much worse than pig shit. Phyllis stood in her nylon slip, her voice was shaky. But you have to be realistic. There have always been wars and people who make trouble, you, you couldn't just let them all take over. People who make trouble, Jesus, woman, has it seriously not occurred to you that it's us who make most of the trouble and do most of the taking over? And he eventually goes to sleep. So she sat up 
Alone in her slip on the hard wooden chair at his desk, her body rigid and numb with cold while her mind adjusted to this new perspective. Thinking along paths which she had hidden from herself, obscure and overgrown. It was important to feel the cold air striking on her shoulders. If she got into bed now beside Nikki, her new perceptions might dissolve into mere happiness, which was not enough. She was remembering how, while she watched the television news, her awareness would flip back and forth between the steady and regretful voice of the broadcaster and grubby, unclear snatches of actual film from the war in Vietnam, soldiers wading waist deep in vast river water or struggling through jungle foliage, cowering villagers lamenting in their language, accusing and gesturing at an awful heaps of rags. She pushed those film snatches away as if they were fragments from a dream. Or was she taken refuge, cowardly, in the safe, sane voice of the man in charge, trusting that he knew that what you saw was bearable? You didn't need to worry. It was admissible within the frame of your reality. What if that man lied? What if those snatches were from another, more terrible reality, equal with your own? Or more real, even? What then? And that really is her, her Nike transformation when mm. she changes utterly and it doesn't make her a sophisticated political operator. It's not that. And in fact, in that argument, I'm not completely on Nikki's side. I mean, I, 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 or what I would say is in my mind, I absolutely think both things. And that I, I believe that, you know, the same men and now women in suits in meetings mm really are making decisions to drop bombs on villagers and I think we need them and then I think the other thing and then I and I I, I have I, I don't take sides in the book really with the counterculture I just I'm fascinated by putting if you like um, Roger and stability and the foreign office actually under a Harold Wilson government that chose not to go into Vietnam and Nikki's perspective, just side by side, arguing with each other. You know, it is a conversation, and, and they they have interesting conversations. And Phyllis isn't that aware sometimes about what is being talked about, but it's continuing, isn't it? Yes, that that because I I think we spoke earlier. There's your technique is really interesting because I I think I use the word triangulation, which I heard first mm. from the geography. Mm. Yeah. So a character is, is represented and then you see the character from the point of view of another character or mm. the character is put in another context which mm. sort of makes her feel a bit out of place. Yeah. Yeah. And so it really enriches our understanding as a yeah. reader. Of, it, it's really one of the great things novels can do yeah. by having, and especially if you do... I, I love to be omniscient in novels and I like giving lots of points of view as well as sometimes my own commentary and, and watch do that triangulation. So, uh, for instance, there's that scene there, but then uh, later on, not a few weeks later, she's talking to Roger on the phone and suddenly she thinks his voice is sanity. And he says, I haven't been ordering any bombings on women and children. What, what kind of a job do you think I have? You know, yeah. The, the triangulation is, can be an ongoing scene setting where nothing is resolved and you don't end up mm. taking sides. Although that's, that makes it sound a bit woolly. All of the sides have yeah, think, their argument. Yeah, so I think it makes it more of a realist novel, mm. in a way, because that, that is how we experience it. It's not a polemic, isn't it? Certainly. Yeah, we can't stay within one version. Somebody else will come along and talk to us, and we realize, oh yes, we that's we misunderstood something. Yeah, and that's what's so interesting about Ladbroke Road. And I want to, I we I don't want to hold Tessa. I want to leave um, time for us to have a um, conversation, all of us, with Ladbroke. But I I wondered what Ladbroke Road represented for me in terms of the novel, in allowing that uh, more kind of multiplicity of characters and stories and lives, especially Barbara Jones, like it's fascinating mm. her character, a nurse from Barbados and what her small triangulation in a way, yeah, isn't it? To have to do the well 
I have Phyllis sort of, if you like, having a conversion experience and then not long after leaving her respectable bourgeois home and committing to the new, the unknown, and sort of imagining at first that everyone around her is in elaborate growth is with her. Well, you know, everybody's in the revolution here. Everyone does as they like. It's all one crazy party. And then she comes across Barbara, who lives just a few doors down from Nikki inside this great building full of sort of bedsuits. And Barbara is a nurse from Grenada and is dedicatedly studying and training and has taken the room simply because it's cheap and really doesn't like <laughs> to share the toilet and the security and is glad that the place is going to fall down. And, you know, that, that to have another triangulation mm-hmm. on the counterculture of West London was, of course, you know, to, to have somebody like that. And it, it was absolutely full of nurses from the Caribbean mm-hmm. who were working incredibly hard to get their qualifications. Because it, it must have been that you were working on this book. Um, and fortunately, there were some fascinating sort of photo documentaries about with, with the um, new, the Windrush generation mm. being in the news. Mm. So this kind of um, ongoing political. What's it? There's, there's the wonderful black photographers, isn't it? Charlie Phillips, isn't it? So I do think it's, yes, I just look yeah. at lots and lots of those pictures. For my so the whole building, too, is. is it's a wonderful setting, so different to the home in the yeah. opening chapter. Actually, do you know I completely invented that building? You know, there aren't that many Art Deco buildings in London, no. in fact. Oh, I was in that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I just, it came to me, and that's how I imagined it, and then I had fun imagining it. Because it's, it, again, there's a, it's a fascinating place, isn't it? Because it is going to be all torn down. Mm. Because they're building a huge flyover, a motorway. Right over the motorway. So, yeah. But so bringing the motorways in down yeah. and to take the commuters out. And yeah. Commuters yeah. Out yeah. Again. And in fact, I didn't know that was, I knew the Westway, I've driven on it, not been driven on it. But it was when I was doing some sort of research, it's too dignified a name, but just yeah. soaking myself in West London, which I didn't know at the time. I was a child and I didn't, I didn't know that part of the world very well at all soaking myself in it and then starts to read everywhere all these blogs and down memory lane things about the Westway being cutting its sway mm. across the old, often very handsome buildings, mm. which is a sort of horrible intrusion. But I must admit, it immediately struck me as a brilliant metaphor. That one of those felicitous things yeah. that, you, that, that is real, but you immediately feel that, that you'll have it in your book. Yeah. And, and then it's the sort of the wasteland that the prep, the demolition in preparation for the Westway has left behind is the scene of the wildest party in the book. Yeah, right. we're happening. We're That's happening. Yeah, a free concert where yeah. Colette, her yeah. daughter, yeah. makes another life, makes her own life changing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there was to really, and there was the nation. to her mother's consternation because yeah. yeah. Just, uh, I mean, that, that's what I, I. My last question, and I won't hold it anymore, is it seems to me that. Your characters seem to have lives that are going on be- way beyond the novel. And has it ever struck you that you might like to pick up on one of these characters? I think I've never probably not. Story, no? Probably not. You should feel when you finish a, not writing a novel, you have told your readers everything they need to know. Now that's right. that's your readers should feel curious. I wonder what happens to him and so on. But you mm-hmm. should feel. You've told them everything they need to know. But I have to admit, I have once reused characters in a couple of short stories, which then cropped up in a novel that anybody noticed. And uh, because it's my oldest book, that is to say, I've never set a book in the 1960s before, I did find myself speculating about what happened to them. And I know what happens to Nikki. Nikki, of course, becomes a publisher. And what was really funny when I sent the manuscript, to my ex-publisher, Dan Franklin, who's retired, he said, I was there. I was in Ladbroke Grove in those years. So perhaps my Nikki grew up into Dan Franklin, oh. which was a nice thought. I mean, I didn't know that when I got So I knew that's what becomes of Nikki. And of course, Phyllis, if she is 95 now, mm-hmm. if she's hung on to those two shabby flats in Ladbroke Grove that she bought for probably a few hundred pounds with mm-hmm. a mortgage through Sam. Um, she has really done very well for herself. So I hope she did. And I hope she's got a little 
gold and um, her son Michael looks after her. How did she even grow up and never married and lived with her like Doris Lessing? You know, Doris Lessing had that son. That's true. The, the last yeah, son, what she didn't was. abandon. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Well, that's been so fascinating. Uh, um, let's hear it for Phyllis and, and Michael. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, just to reiterate our thanks for such a wonderful conversation with the two of you. I think another round of applause actually for both of you. So yes, yeah, so we have about some, just over about half an hour or so for some questions. So over to you, who would like to ask a question? Mother, yes, and I was wondering what your inspiration was behind those characters. Different question. I, again, I think I just made them up, but I, I do know one of the impulses. I always have to be careful that my books aren't too nice, and I thought I want to make someone who really quite unlike, and I that so that was a conscious, deliberate thing, and I, I made Marley. Pretty unsympathetic, but I can never help somewhere I think I've written her backstory in. There's that one moment when she goes in search of Phyllis with some really horrible news that she's going to tell her. And she knocks on the door of what was Nikki's room, but it isn't any longer. And in fact, poet Liz is there, who's, who's a, a lesbian we think. And mind for one moment. I say something like she looked at, at something that might have been, and she also felt her own claims. So I give you, even her, I, I, I give a bit of a sympathy of something, simply too strong word. But that's, yeah, and, and just, again, I suppose, when I was talking about being very even handed in the book and not wanting it in the least to be, it certainly isn't a story about, oh my God, British. Bourgeoisie was so awful, thank goodness, these wonderful revolutions swept it away and people were happy at last. That, that would have been a, not the one that would to write. But I, 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 so I made Roger really, in certain aspects, it's very, I hope, I hope very likable. Lots of things that aren't like that. So I, I did need to have in the book some of the really awful aspects of that class and that time, the really stifling aspects. So I whole things. I put quite a lot onto those two women and their sort of their house in wherever it is. Is it I think I, I think it's good. I've just momentarily forgotten. Anyway. That, that's the story behind them. You make a great reading and you make those two characters. It, exactly. That's why you mustn't make your books too nice. Cause, cause, yes. And, and also, of course, those characters are always great fun to write. I had fun writing her, making the Christmas dinner. You kind of like, you know, it would be that nice to eat. It's always lots of steam. But I can remember my, my grandmother used to cook with a lot of, who was, who was extremely nice, but there was always a lot of steam, those candles that would be lifted up, and then a great smell of. Having just boiling the hours and that sort of how I imagine. The Christmas decorations as well. Yeah. yeah. The Christmas decorations were from my grandparents' house. They did, they borrowed them. Oh, I love it that you were those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Many thanks, Tessa. That was absolutely wonderful. Is it too simple, too crude to ask you, uh, was Phyllis happier at the end or the beginning? Yeah. Of course, it's a great, it's impossible to answer. My mum would say unhappier. She made the most terrible mistake and mum can't forgive her. Who can weigh up happiness? She, I suppose what matters is, I think she thinks she's happier. I think... Uh, 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 it's, it is a bit of a spoiler, but it right in the final pages, in fact, sort of almost the last thing we get is, I decided not to end it, but the last thing we get of her is 
<laughs> Sorry, Mum, I've been voting for my mum. But Mum found very distressing. She's she's really is just sleeping around with almost anybody. And, and there's this guy who comes to this little scuzzy factory where she's working and takes her out and they have sex on the bank of the Thames. And to my mother, that was just horrible. But when we put them on the bank of the Thames, I was really thinking in my mind, something almost Shakespearean, you know? I, I didn't name the Thames until that point. The river is there in quite a lot of the book, just slowly unnamed, flowing through the book. But at the end, we go right up to it, down to its awfulness with all that debris. And he lays out this blanket and she doesn't even care that he's laid it out for her. And I kind of meant that to be a really radical image of dangerous openness. Now, whether that's happiness, but I think it feels like happiness. It says she never forgot it. She remembered the sky. And I, I don't know how to weigh happiness and whether she would have been, she would have been less, that's what I would think. I think what I like about her, she's not my kind of person at all, she's so not bookish or what I like about her is her bravado. She has a kind of bravado in her. And we see it right in the first chapter where Nikki kisses her and she thinks, he's my lover. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go and meet him. And that, that sort of appetite and bravado, maybe it would have been a shame if that had ended up being a applied to doing the church flowers or, you know, discussion group on Thursdays. Maybe that would have been less in the world. But I, I think when I think about women I have known who were of that generation, they, they were much, I'm thinking about lovely Nell Dunn, the, the writer, who really did leave a very posh bourgeois family and kind of lived the counterculture. Um, I think, I think they felt they could breathe. Now, I'm not sure it's quite, you know, that, they, that it was bigger, that the world had opened in some way for them. So does that make it, it's a very tentative answer. I, I can imagine, it would be a very boring novel, but I can imagine an alternative sliding door thing where Nikki never came to dinner that night. She never kissed anyone in the dark garden, and she grew old in relative containment. You know, it, it is not desperate. She doesn't need to be rescued. Anyone else? I let me also give you some detail in the book, the way you picture up the period of society and the science. Like the village one, the new one, the also part of dresses. And I just, I was wondering, like, how do you, how do you take it all in? Because I feel like, you know, it's very difficult to remember those things. What do you? Well, but of course, I was actually a child in the sixties. So what a child is doing is not seeing the sociology or the or or, or the engineering of, of society behind what they're looking at. But what a child is doing is noticing that her aunt has a nice black dress, actually two, she had a black one and a white one. This was the aunt who lived in Surrey. She used to wear a red rose tucked down into the prison with the white dress. I can sort of remember that. So that's exactly what you notice as a child, isn't it? And you notice the food. So I can remember my mum making those rather fatty terrines and me actually not locking the lumps fat in very much so I couldn't have to make it. So that is that, and, and do you know, that's why I don't think I would ever write a novel set before 1960s. I've written a couple of short stories set in the 20s and just before the First World War. And in both cases, I had some very strong material to work with. One of them was, I was reviewing, I think, for The Guardian, a factual book about wild girls and it had this marvellous story in it about school of school girls who had one of their teachers was arrested for being a suffragette and breaking windows and not And the whole school got behind her and sort of had a school strike and broke windows and some of the teachers were good. And I when I was reviewing this book, I wrote, 
why are we all watching Downton Abbey on telly when these stories are around there? And that's not them either. So I go back short story, but back all the details there for me. I can remember thinking, so what would my teacher have for her lunch? And then I thought, well, I've read some mm -hmm. automatic scores. No, I read D. H. Lawrence's The Rainbow when I first year as a teacher. Now, what did she used to warm up for her evening meal when she got home to her lodging? So I looked, you can look it all up. Four Mary's Ford was what I was thinking, this teacher who's a pacifist and she hates the war when it comes. What 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 words would she have for her opposition to the war? And so I looked at Ford Mary's Ford with Valentine, marvelous heroine in that book in Parade's End. And uh, I Literally, you know, I, I looked at what phrases she used because idiom, idiom is incredibly important. It is the details like the food, but it's also the idiom. And I do credit in the end of this novel my wonderful source, which somebody put me on to, in fact, our friend John Williams put me on to, which was a compendium put together in the 1980s from all the people who were there in the counterculture remembering it, some very critical of it, some very enthusiastic. And that was where I got my feeling from, and the, the sort of, some of the almost ridiculous sounding stuff I put in there, like, you know, there were people who thought if all the governments of the world dropped acid together, we'd probably get peace. So really, no, I, I didn't make that up, it sounds like a travesty, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was, and there, there was, in that book, Compiled, compiled in the 80s, there was Jonathan Meads talking about the hippies walking through the crowds in London and how they, they, were, they behaved like an aristocracy among peasants. And I thought, so you have to be a terrible thief, basically, don't you? You say you start with your own stuff. And that, that's why I was going to say, I, I, I want to show you how my grandfather's memoirs were. I would be, I could never write a novel set in the 19th century. I feel I had to, I didn't couldn't ground it in what I knew. Anyone else? Um, I'm just curious, uh, you mentioned when you read the opening that you specified the year mm. and things like the river at some points are not named. Mm. Is there a reason you felt you needed the year to be specified rather than the mm. circumstances of the novel sort of direct the reader yeah. and an idea of when it's... I quite, I'm, I'm quite a believer in, you know that you often get told on creative writing, of course, it's show not tell, and that's always seems to be ridiculous. It's like that Christmas party game where you have to go around and say, it's a film, and you know, this man, he walked in with a really red face and waved his arms around, but just say he was angry. So, in other words, often the neatest, most elegant economical solution to be letting you know really early on that we are not now, that we're in the 1960s, is for me to tell you in order to do it like that, you have to establish in the, in the contract with the reader, which you set up in the very first sentence, that you have the kind of narrator who can do that. If I was all inside Phyllis's head, obviously I couldn't do that. If I was just saying, she felt this, and then she had to do this, and I'm doing a little bit of that, but I, I've also got the movement to come out of her head and say, this is what she would look like. She was this sort of person. She was, later on I say, you know, she was stubborn. The minute she, she took that into her head that she had a lover, that was her character. And I, I just love having that whole range of resources as a narrator, right through from sometimes going inside your character and feeling with them, and sometimes not having to do an elaborate pantomime of showing, but just tell your reader economically and straight. It's 1967, she's like this. This is why it happened. And the reason I don't mention the terms is not because I'm being evasive, it's, it's, to, it's because I feel it's like a, I'm sure by the way, this is totally for me, I don't expect any reader not to see this, but I felt it as a great mythic, Force of London 
brown and wide and dirty, kind of coiling through the city. And, and the children, early on, we learned that Colette, when she was a bit younger, you know, she and her yeah, friends had a boat, a raft yeah. out on it, and then he ran. lost her glasses and they nearly drowned. Just, just, I wanted the river to feel charged and magical and mythic. And I didn't even want to name it. And I anyway, I knew it's London, it can only be the And then I and then I I didn't know in advance that I was going to do that, but right at the end, and I had Phyllis, you know, on the blanket with the with the salesman. Um I I felt it was the moment. I'm sure there is that isn't it in oh my god, isn't it in the wasteland or something? There's some chorus in the wasteland where I lay down by ten. So I feel as if there's some mythic or folk songy thing that Elias invokes a, a, a rather hopelessly. I have no idea what it is now, but I, maybe I, I knew more exactly when I chose that bit. Maybe I didn't. Maybe it was just chiming in the back of my mind. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Mm. Uh, Elliot, but there is some. There is. Yeah. There is. By, by the turn, by lay down, or something. No, Liz, thank something you. Like that. That, it is like yeah. that. And that's what I was thinking mm. somewhere. Mm. Not, not expecting anybody to, mm. to think that, but maybe that it would chime for a reader all the same. Does that answer the question about what we tell and what we don't? Any more for any more? You, um, I think you said at the beginning that this has been adapted for television. Uh, that, I wouldn't go so far as that. I've sold an option. And if you know anything about that stuff. <laughs> I, 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 but it would be really nice, and they're good. They're good people. It's an Italian production company. The people who made the Elena Ferranti adaptation. How do you feel about letting Phyllis and Roger go to somebody else? Quite well, uh, price. Every Mulligan, I'm imagining. That'd be nice. I don't know. It's an untried thing. I think I feel okay about it. I feel the book is the book, and the book is what I care about and love. And I can't help being quite interested if it ever did happen. But I, I hope I can count too much on it. I, mean, I don't think I would. I, I feel books that I do, and but it would be fun. It would be fun. And I, I wouldn't. Pay, play any role. I, I didn't want to scream right to so I don't know how that's done. I have no idea how to do that. It seems like the opposite of novel writing. In novel writing, you have to, you, you are doing, you are the camera and the lighting man and the continuity girl, etc., and the set dresser and the costume. So to, to sort of devolve all that to a whole team and just make bits of dialogue, I, I would have no idea. It's also using the characters, you know, they're three dimensional in the novel, yeah, and two dimensional. Yeah, I'm not in a great film, but the odds are not that many films are great, so yeah, <laughs> it's different anyway, isn't it? Even when characters are three dimensional in a film, it's like a different thing, and yeah, no, the film doesn't have that fabulous resource of the novel to render. The, the textures of, of somebody's experience and their psyche moving around in the little space they're in, living their life. I mean, not only the wonderful technology, actually. Well, and film is brilliant, just as <laughs> good, but, but it's something, it does something else. It does something completely different. I'm trying to think of the films that are most novelistic in my life, maybe. Like Bergman's Man in Alexander's quite like, novelistic, isn't it? Mm. Um, but it's interesting that the idea that you wouldn't want to do that. Actually, most novelists probably don't. They just no. wash their hands. It's kind of weird. Yeah. You do. I think you have to let it go. Yeah. I think that's right. Someone else would be better. Kind of she got involved in. Even the theatre, actually. She, 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 was there. she was there every night, yeah. I believe. She loved it. She loved it. And that's. What a, what a yeah. brilliant thing for her. And yeah. I, I haven't actually seen the theatre adaptation, but the telly was good, but it wasn't. It was very different. 
for the most. I mean, I mean, and I'm so, it, it's so huge compared to actually what a film is slow. That's, mm -hmm. um, that is not a negative, it's just yeah. different. The yeah. scale is different. That is one of the things that the novel is quite unique in a way. It's, there is so much more to it, even an average length, modest novel like this. There's a hell of a lot of words in it. You can do a lot of stuff in it. And actually to, to make a, a film, I mean, it's first of all a radical act of cutting. Although actually I think it, if I if I don't do if this thing doesn't get made, it might be a main stage for the film. Yes, so John, what was what it that book grow in the 1960s for the beam? It was a visual component that is yeah. location. Yeah. Or, I mean, yeah. Like that. And I suspect they bought it because it was a 60s moment and it may be that that moment. That was suddenly vogueish, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. but I can't think what they are, but there were quite a few names. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it would be fun to do. It would be, it would be yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say what a treat it was to be reading this film. And because there's a way in which you know, you know, it read out loud rather than inside my mm. head, mm. brought another dimension mm. to it, another mm. texture. And the, the the thing that really struck me was the confiding class of the curious. Yeah, and that description. I absolutely love that. And there's the your language, um, you know, the experience of the the story of one thing, the experience of the language is another thing, and that stays in a different. Time frame, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose you sort of one hopes that the, you're right, the story moves and changes as it should and must, and that's one dimension of one dynamic trajectory. Mm -hmm. but, but there is something else, the residue that it leaves on the page and the shapes of language. Yeah. And in the in the two, the first extract and the second one, I was struck because in both she's sitting. Mm. And the air is caressing her shoulder. Yeah. And the first one is flirting. Yeah. And the second it's cold and yeah. getting her away. Yeah. yeah. So the placing of that yeah. you know, and the language you have. You're absolutely right. I've never read those two passages beside each other. And I can't really recover how consciously I was echoing that, that opening. I must I must have been aware of it. I mean, that's her posture, sitting in the petticoat in both, yes. in both of them. Yeah, so yeah, that tells you so much about her, that she's yeah. somebody who yeah. sits where yeah. other things are going on in different places. Yeah. And... I did sense that bit as I was reading. Jeff Dyer said I've done the best description of a penis. But I sense it. I might be strong with it more than... <laughs> still being recorded. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good next mentor. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. If, if, if nobody has more questions, um, I'd like to invite you once again to thank Professor and Susan for such a fantastic conversation and some questions. So, yes, please join me. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. And can I thank Anna and Mark who, and Rob as well, and Paul Colin who has COVID who have all been a wonderful team to work with, and without them, this would not be possible. And there are other names as well I should have mentioned for being behind the scenes. The third team for Godmother will definitely punish you if you have a question for the thirteenth Godmother. I always think of that when I'm thanking people. I think I'll have missed out that 13th from our resident owl. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Been recording everything. And, and there's a camera hidden in there, so <laughs> welcome to me. It's remarkably unamused. Yes, it hasn't enjoyed itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we'll, we'll circulate, yeah, we'll circulate the um, feedback forms now. So, if you have a couple of minutes to spare, we really would appreciate it. It's it's double sided, just so you're aware of that. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have our volunteers will have a this from you um, once you finish. But, yes, once again, thank you very much. Here. We have some pens as well if we could. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you very much, Steve. Okay.